right, good morning, everyone. Left, 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 right, left, 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 right, left, 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 right, left, 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 right, left. He's gonna come with the clouds. All the armies of heaven He's gonna come with the clouds With all his saints and his angels We're gonna march in with him We're gonna sing and shout We're gonna march in with him It's gonna be a rout We're gonna ride in with him To end the final war them them riding with him, then there'll be peace for sure. Left, left, right, left, 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 right, left. He's gonna come with the clouds to establish his kingdom. He's gonna come with the clouds, and every eye's gonna see. We're gonna march in with him, we're gonna sing and shout We're gonna march in with him, it's gonna be a ride We're gonna ride in with him, to end the final war We're gonna ride in with him, then there'll be peace for sure Then you and me, will worship our great King, yeah! Left, right, left We're gonna come with the clouds With all the armies of heaven He's gonna come with the clouds With all his saints and his angels We're gonna march in with him We're gonna sing and shout We're gonna march in with him It's gonna be a rout we're gonna ride in with him to end the final war We're gonna ride in with him, then there'll be peace for sure Then you and me will worship our great King, yeah! He's gonna come with the clouds With all the armies of heaven He's gonna come with the clouds With all his saints and his angels We're gonna march in with him We're gonna sing and shout We're gonna march in with him It's gonna be a rout We're gonna ride in with him To end the final war We're gonna ride in with him Then there'll be peace for sure Left, 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 right, left Left, 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 right, left. Company, halt, dismiss. <laughs> I'll hang the guitar up right back. I'll be right back. All right, good morning again. Hope you like that last song. I don't play it that often, but it's a song about the second advent. And uh, it's one of those songs that it, when I wrote it, I was like, eh, there's not too much to it musically. And it was like, but then when I, I listen to it now, I, uh, when I, I had I played it. I hadn't played it since, uh, gee, I don't know when I did. I think I played it a lot at Prairie View at the beginning. Then when I went to Marion, I didn't play it very often. And then when I was in Massachusetts, I, I resurrected the song. And I was like, I said, eh, it's not too bad, you know, because... 
it's kind of clever, you know. We're gonna march in with him, you know. You know the second advent, you know, and uh, we we'll ride in with him. And I'm going left, right, left. I, I just, I thought that was pretty, you know. When I did it, I was like, that's pretty clever. Yeah, that's kind of funny. And uh, so, anyways, hope you like the song. And um, kind of a, a, a song. It's a song about the second advent of Christ. I got a few of those. It, it won't be long. That one, and then I got uh, every knee shall bow, which I played actually at uh, for the first time at uh, DBC the other day on Sunday. So. All right, so um, good to have you all with us, and we're going to uh, continue our study of Jude verse 15, uh, uh, Jude 14 and 15. We, we looked at Jude 14 uh, on uh, Saturday, and uh, today and tomorrow we'll be looking at Jude 15, and actually on next Saturday as well. Um, it, uh, there's a lot of things in this, these two verses about the second advent of Christ, and also the second advent of Christ in relation to these Jewish zealots, which I've been started to bring out on uh, Saturday. So... This is our subject here today, as you'll see on the board, we'll be doing, uh, talking about uh, in Jude 15, that the Lord Jesus, in the purpose clause of Jude 15, it's the purpose clause for the declarative statement in verse 14, as we saw. Uh, in this first purpose clause, we'll see that the Lord Jesus Christ will return at his second advent in order to judge every unrepentant, unregenerate person. Then uh, Thursday, we'll be seeing, uh, talking about, uh, continuing the study, the first, the purpose clause there in verse 15. The uh, that part of the purpose clause, which basically asserts that Jesus Christ at his second advent will uh, return in order to convict every unrepentant, unregenerate person. And so we'll be looking at that uh, on Thursday. So without further ado, as we normally do, as is our custom, we take a moment of silent prayer to examine ourselves to determine if we're in fellowship with God because any mental, verbal, or overt act of sin that we knowingly commit will cause us to lose fellowship with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But according to 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins to the Father, He, God the Father, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. In other words, He purifies us from each and every wrongdoing. We maintain that fellowship by obeying the Spirit who speaks to us through the Scriptures which He's inspired. And that's when we're obeying the commands of Ephesians 5, 18 to be filled with the Spirit and Colossians 3, 16 to let the Word of Christ richly dwell in our souls. So, if there's anything that's bothering you, if anything is bothering you, disturbing, distracting to you, do what 1 Peter 5, 7 says. Cast all your anxieties upon the Lord because He cares for you. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given to us another day to study your word. We thank you for your word and all the wonderful things that we've been learning in your word over the years uh, and here at Winston Bible Ministries. And I just thank you for the gift you've given me. And I just pray, Father, that you would use me mightily as your instrument today to bring forth your full counsel today with regards to this passage in Jude verses 14 and 15, which teach on the second advent of Jesus Christ. And I just pray, Father, that today help me to uh, be sensitive to the Spirit's guidance and direction uh, to be humble and uh, to um, with, uh, be uh, uh, communicate your, your word to your people in, in a fashion that brings glory to you and your son by doing so by with reverence and respect and power. And I also pray that, and as a result, that I pray that your people would get their necessary spiritual nourishment. I also pray that you would also uh, help your people in the audience by the power of the Spirit to learn, understand, and apply what they're being taught, to be sensitive as, as well to the, the guidance and direction of the Holy Spirit. And we pray that as a result, they, they would continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, your Son. I also pray for the technology. Thank you for it. People take advantage of it. We pray it would function properly. There'd be no problems with the recordings, the video and the audio, and upload these things to our various websites and podcasts and media platforms that you've given to us. I pray you protect them all and use them mightily. And also thank you for the uh, streaming uh, service, live service by uh, YouTube. I thank you for them, their, their service, and I pray you would use it mightily and protect it from the evil one. So, Father, we pray for this service in our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ's name, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. If you uh, haven't turned there already, please go to Jude's, uh, the Epistle of Jude, look at verse 1, and we'll read the first 15 verses, and then we'll look at verses verse 15 in detail, verses 14 and 15. So, I'm going to read from uh, the, the Net Bible, these verses, Jude verses 1 through 15. So, it says in Jude 1, in the Net Bible, from Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who were called, wrapped in the love of God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. 
May mercy, peace, and love be lavished on you. Dear friends, although I've been eager to write to you about our common salvation, I now feel compelled instead to write to encourage you to contend earnestly for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. For certain men have secretly slipped in among you, who long ago were marked out for the condemnation I'm about to describe. Ungodly men who have turned the grace of our God into a license for evil and who deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Now I desire to remind you, even though you've been fully, fully informed of these facts once for all, that Jesus, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, later destroyed those who did not believe. You also know that the angels, who did not keep within their proper domain, but abandoned their own place of residence, he is kept in eternal chains and utter darkness, locked up for the judgment of the great day. So also Sodom and Gomorrah and the neighboring towns, since they indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire in a way similar to these angels, are now displayed as an example by suffering the punishment of eternal fire. Yet these men, as a result of their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and insult the glorious ones. But even when Michael, the archangel, was arguing with the devil and debating with him concerning Moses' body, he did not dare to bring a slanderous judgment, but said, May the Lord rebuke you. But these men do not understand the things they slander, and they are being destroyed by the very things that, like irrational animals, they instinctively comprehend. Woe to them, for they have traveled down Cain's path, and because of greed, have abandoned themselves to Balaam's error. Hence, they will certainly perish and Korah's rebellion. These men are dangerous reefs at your love feast, feasting without reverence, feeding only themselves. They are waterless clouds, carried along by the winds, autumn trees without fruit, twice dead and uprooted, wild sea waves, spewing out the foam of their shame, wayward stars for whom the utter depths of eternal darkness have been reserved. Now, Enoch, the seventh in descent, beginning with Adam, even prophesied of them, saying, Look, the Lord is coming with thousands and thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict every person of all their thoroughly ungodly deeds that they have committed and of all the harsh words that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So uh, if you could look at verses 14 and 15 in my translation, Verses 14 and 15. Now, in fact, Enoch, who is the seventh in descent from Adam, prophesied against the individuals like these, namely by asserting, look, the Lord is returning with a countless number of his holy ones in order to execute judgment against each and every person, specifically for the purpose of convicting and each, each and every person because of each and every one of their ungodly actions, which they committed in an ungodly manner. Correspondingly, because of each and every one of their harsh words, which they have spoken against them. Now, as we pointed out on Saturday, uh, Jude 14 and 15 contain a quotation from 1 Enoch 1, 9 and a prophecy concerning the second advent of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, just to interject something about the second advent of Christ, it's distinct from the rapture of the church. Uh, as we pointed out, the rapture of the church is not preceded by signs. It's simply imminent. Whereas the second advent of Christ, signs precede it. And that's made clear by the Lord in his Olivet Discourse at Matthew 24. We also pointed out that the rapture is to deliver the church from the wrath of God, which we poured out upon the inhabitants of earth during the 70th week of Daniel with the seven seal trumpet bowl judgments that are uh, talked about in, uh, in great detail in Revelation chapter 6 through 18. And uh, also the second advent of Christ, on the other hand, in contrast to that, it's uh, Christ comes back with the church uh, to deliver Israel from Satan, the fallen angels, Antichrist, the false prophet, and the tribulational armies. And the second advent is going to be visible to the entire world. Every eye shall see him. Uh, Revelation 1-7, John teaches us that. Whereas the rapture, only the church will see him. It's invisible to the rest of the world. And uh, the rapture was a mystery. It was not known to Old Testament saints. And uh, Paul makes that clear when he talks about the resurrection, the rapture of the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 to 58. And then, whereas the second advent of Christ was, was prophesied about throughout the Old 
Testament. It's also found in the New Testament. So that's a, a, a couple of uh, uh, distinctions between the rapture and the second advent of Christ. For, and second of all, or well, lastly, I, I would say, uh, the rapture has to happen in order for this, the, the, the second advent to take place. And, and, and actually, specifically, the rapture has to happen in, in order for the 70th week of Daniel, the tribulation period, to start. That's, we saw that in our study of 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through uh, 12, where the, the Spirit, who's the restrainer in, in, in that passage, uh, is indwelling the church. Each member of the church is indwelt by the, the, uh, the Spirit. And when the, the rapture takes place and the church is removed from the earth and, gets their, and they get their resurrection bodies, the Spirit will be removed as well. And that simply means he'll still, remember, he's omnipresent. He'll, he'll still be present on the earth during the tribulation period. It's that he won't be localized. With a, and a group of believers like he is right now during the church age. And so when that happens, then there's nothing to restrain uh, Satan to uh, manifest his, his man, the Antichrist. So we saw that in great detail in our study of 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 12. So Jude 14 and 15, as I said before, contain a quotation from 1 Enoch 1, 9, as well as a prophecy concerning the second advent of Jesus Christ. Now these verses are composed of a declarative statement, which appears in verse 14, and it's followed by two purpose clauses, which appear in verse 15. And the second purpose clause explains in greater detail the first. I make that clear in my translation, as you can see. Now, the declarative statement in verse 14, as we pointed out on Saturday, asserts that Enoch, who is the seventh in genealogical descent from Adam, prophesied against individuals like these unregenerate Jewish zealots living in the first century A.D., so he, as we pointed out, left off on uh, Saturday, um, this prophecy is about the second advent of Jesus Christ and how he'll judge every unrepentant, unsaved person uh, on the face of the earth at the second advent, which ends again the tribulation period, 70th week of Daniel. And he's comparing uh, the judgment of these uh, individuals to the judgment of the Jewish zealots who were in Jude's day and age. And that's indicated by the fact that uh, he uses the, compa uh, these, the figure of speech called simile, and he uses it in verses 12 and 13, and he carries it over into verse 14. And that's made clear by the fact that the Holy Spirit who inspired uh, Jude and also uh, to put this down, this prophecy down in Scripture, uh, knew in his omniscient that the omniscience that these uh, Jewish zealots would not be alive at the time of the second heaven to Christ. And so, so contextually, there's evidence for uh, the similes being used in verse 14, and also uh, we know theologically as well. So uh, we see that the declarative statement in Jude 14 again asserts that Enoch, who is the seventh in this geneal genealogical descent from Adam, prophesied against individuals like these unregenerate Jewish zealots who were living in the first century A.D. And as we pointed out many times. And uh, I reiterate this because there's always new people coming into our broadcast through YouTube. It's not like you're in a church building and you, you know the people in the building and you know who somebody who's new walks in. I never know who's walking into our classes, whether it's li listening or watching them on our Wednesday.org page, our main website, or Faith Life Sermons page where we put our MP3, MP4s, or our YouTube page, and uh, or uh, the podcast. We're on, we have uh, podcasts on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon Music, over 2,000 of them. And so uh, we don't, I don't have no idea who these people are unless they contact me. So, but they do come in, uh, both believers and non-believers. So for their benefit, the Jewish zealots uh, were individuals who were one of the four great pillars of Jewish society in the first century AD. They were trying to persuade the citizens of Judea in the first century AD to uh, uh, join with them in their rebellion against Rome. For they believed by attacking Rome, this would prompt the Messiah to come and deliver Israel and establish the kingdom of God on earth. They were loyal to the law. They were zealous for the law. And also they got their inspiration from the Maccabeans who were used in the uh, in second century BC to get rid of Antiochus Epiphanes IV who was committing genocide against the Jewish people and brought an end to the, the sacrifices in the temple and was, uh, as I said before, committing Jew uh, genocide. And so, and then the Maccabees, which they're talked about in first, second, and third Maccabees in the Apocrypha of the Catholic, Roman Catholic Bible, uh, they were the zealot, uh, the Maccabeans were trying to pre uh, protect the Jewish culture and religion from the Greco Greek culture and language and uh, religion. 
And so the, the, the Jewish zealots got their inspiration from these uh, Maccabeans. And uh, of course, the, the Jewish, as we pointed out also, the Jewish zealots were also, uh, they were also, uh, uh, they were started by a man named Judas the Galilean. They started in Galilee in the beginning of the uh, uh, of the uh, the first century. So that's where Jesus and the apostles were, right? So there was also a man named Simon the Zealot who was chosen as to be an apostle by Jesus, not Simon Peter, but Simon the Zealot. And we know that he that the tag Zealot, the Zealot means that he belonged to this movement. We know that it doesn't describe his character as being zealous for the Lord because if that was the case, he would have joined Peter, James, and John when they went to the transfiguration with Jesus and the Garden of Gethsemane and other places. Uh, and the reason why Peter, James, and John were selected, as, as we saw in the Gospels, to these events in Jesus' life during his first advent was because they were zealous more than the other apostles for Jesus. And so we don't see Simon the Zealot joining them. So uh, these, uh, these zealots, uh, when, Simon the Zealot, uh, when Judas the Galilean was killed by the Romans, his descendants and disciples carried on the cause and the movement picked up um, uh, steam uh, after the death of James. And, uh, and so between 66 and 70 AD, uh, the, the Jewish people following the lead of these zealots rebelled against Rome. And uh, that war was described in Josephus' work called War of the Jews. And it ended up in the destruction of the temple, Herod's temple, uh, the, the destruction of Jerusalem, and the deportation of the citizens of Judea throughout the Roman Empire and into the city of Rome. This was a fulfillment of the Lord's prophecy in the Olivet Discourse, as well as, of course, Daniel 9, 26. So, the, again, that declarative statement in Jude 14 is asserting that Enoch, who is the seventh in genealogical descent from Adam, prophesied against individuals like these zealots living in the first century AD. And those individuals were the citizens of, of the world who were following Antichrist in his rebellion against Jesus Christ. Now, as we pointed out and touched on a few moments ago, Jude 12 and 13 contain five similes, and Jude 14 contains one as well. Human beings, as we saw in these verses 12 and 13, and we just read a little while ago, human beings are not dangerous reefs, waterless clouds, or autumnal trees, or violent waves, or wandering stars for that matter. Thus, in these verses, Jude is making a comparison between these various phenomena of nature and these unregenerate Jewish zealots in the first century A.D., and Jude 14 continues his use of the figure of simile. So he, in this verse, Jude is comparing every unrepentant, unregenerate person living on the earth at the time of Jesus' second advent with these unregenerate Jewish zealots because both will be judged by Jesus Christ because of their ungodly words and actions. Further supporting this interpretation, and I mentioned this a few moments ago, is that the Holy Spirit who inspired Jude to quote from 1 Enoch 1.9, would know from his omniscience that these zealots living in the first century AD would not be living when the second advent of Jesus Christ took place. Therefore, Jude 14 and 15 are asserting that in fact Enoch, who is the seventh uh, in genealog gene genealogical descent from Adam, prophesied against individuals, the citizens of the world under Antichrist rebellion, like these, the Jewish zealots, namely by asserting, look, the Lord is coming with a countless number of his holy ones in order to execute judgment against each and every person, specifically for the purpose of convicting each and every person because of each and every one of their ungodly actions, which they committed in an ungodly manner, correspondingly because of each and every one of their harsh words, which they spoke against him. So like this, the people, unregenerate people of the world living during the time of the 70th week of Daniel, who were rebelling with the Antichrist against Jesus Christ, and thus the Father as well, uh, like these individuals will be judged by Christ at his second advent, so these Jewish zealots would be judged by the Lord Jesus Christ. And he did that through the Roman Empire in 70 AD. Now, Jude 15, as I pointed out to you a few moments ago, contains two infinitival, uh, infinitival uh, purpose clauses which present the purpose of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, returning to planet Earth at his second advent. So there's two infinitive purpose clauses which present in verse 15 the purpose of Jesus Christ returning to planet Earth at his second advent. Now the first asserts that he will return in order to execute judgment against each and every unrepentant, unregenerate person living on the Earth at that time. And the second purpose clause explains the first and contains 
two causal clauses. The sec this second purpose clause asserts that he will return at his second advent in order to convict each and every unrepentant, unregenerate person living on the earth at that time. Now, the first causal clause asserts that he will do this because of each and every one of their ungodly actions, which they committed in an ungodly manner during the course of their entire lives. And the second causal clause corresponds to the first and asserts that the Lord will convict every unregenerate, unrepentant person living on the earth at his second advent because of every one of their harsh words, which they have spoken against him during the course of their entire lives. So therefore, Jude 14 and 15 is emphatically asserting that Enoch, who is the seventh in descent from Adam, prophesied against individuals like these zealots in the first century AD by stating that the Lord will return at his second advent with a countless number of his elect angels in order to execute judgment against every unrepentant, unregenerate human being living on the earth. And specifically, he will return in order to convict each and every one of them because of their ungodly actions, and which they committed in an ungodly manner during the course of their lives. And correspondingly, he will convict them because of each and every one of their harsh words, which they have spoken against him during the course of their entire lives. And thus, consequently, Jude 14 and 15 served to emphasize with the Christian community in Judea that these unsaved, unregenerate Jewish zealots, like every unsaved, unrepentant person living on the earth at his second at the Christ's second advent, will be judged by Jesus Christ if they do not repent by trusting in him as their Savior. So, uh, now, the Lord, why hasn't he come back? First of all, why, didn't he, why hasn't he come back yet at the, at the rapture? which triggers the 70th week of Daniel to take place. Well, he wants, he still, uh, there's evidently still more uh, uh, people to be born that will be saved that he wants a part of the church. Okay. The other reason is he's trying to be gracious and patient with us because he doesn't want to judge anybody during the events of the tribulation period with the seven seal trumpet and bold judgments uh, mentioned in Revelation 6 to 18. He wants people to, Change their, repent means change their attitude about his son and trust in him. And if they don't, and they're going to go, and they, 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 get, they, they live during the time of the, the 70 week of Daniel, they'll have to experience those judgments, which are horrific. And uh, so he doesn't come back at the second advent because he wants people to get saved. Okay. So he wants, he doesn't come, he's not coming back to, at the rapture immediately right now. And he's, it's been 2,000 years since it was predicted. And, he, he obviously got there's more people to be born and they're, they're going to be members of the body of Christ yet to be born. And also, of course, he doesn't want to judge anybody with the events of the, the, the seven seal trumpet and bold judgments of the 70th week of Daniel. So very patient. And in fact, I you know, believe, you know, of course, Peter, he talks about this. Look at second Peter. You're in Jude. Just back up a little ways. Look at second Peter. Second Peter three. Look at Second Peter three one. Now, interestingly, and I've pointed this out from time to time. First and Second Peter, Hebrews, and Jude. They uh, they are all books written to the the Jewish Christian community, dispersed around the world. Jude is the only one of these epistles that is written to the Jewish Christian community in Judea and not dispersed throughout the Roman Empire. First and second Peter were, Hebrews was, because of the date in which it was written. But Jude is not. Jude was, the people, the Jewish Christian community was still, many of them were still in Judea when Jude wrote this epistle. Whereas the other Hebrews, first and second Peter, they, they're written to Jewish Christians throughout the Roman Empire. Peter makes that clear at the beginning of first Peter. And uh, so, uh, quite interesting. And so, so if you look at Second Peter 3, 1, Peter writes, Dear friends, this is already the second letter I've written you in which I'm trying to stir up your pure mind by way of reminder. I want to recall both the predictions foretold by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord of, our, of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. Above all, understand this. In the last days, and we're in the last days, 
blatant scoffers will come, being propelled by their own evil urges, and saying, where is his promised return? Okay, the second advent. For ever since our ancestors died, all things have continued as they were from the beginning. For they deliberately suppressed this fact, that by the word of God, the word of God, heavens existed long ago, and earth was formed out of water and by means of water. Through these things, the world existing at that time was destroyed when it was del uh, deluged with water. But by the same word, the present heavens and earth have been reserved for fire by being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Now, dear friends, do not let this one thing escape your notice, that a single day is like a thousand years with the Lord, and a thousand years are like a single day. And then he says, the Lord is not slow concerning his promise. His promise to what? To return. See? His, where is his promise return? The, the, the scoffer said. And Peter says, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Lord is not slow concerning his promise to return, of course, as some regard slow, slowness, like these scoffers, but is being patient toward you because he does not wish for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. So, and it's, then it goes on to say, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. When it comes, the heavens will disappear with a horrific noise and celestial bodies will melt away in a blaze and the earth and every deed done on it will be laid bare. And uh, so that's talking about the creation of the new heavens and the new earth in that sense. But also that's true of the second advent. It could be talking about that too, uh, because kind of merging the two because the second advent, uh, the, 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 uh, the, um, the 70th week of Daniel will come like a, a thief in the night. It's, uh, that's what uh, Peter, uh, Paul talks about. And we study this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 through 12, because the inhabitants on planet Earth who were living on the Earth at the time of the, the rapture and then the 70th week of Daniel, uh, the events of the tribulation period will take them by surprise. Take them like a thief in the night. So go back now to Jude. Go back to Jude verse 14 and 15. <laughs> Okay, so if you look at Jude 14 and 15, got look at my translation, please. On the board. So it says in Jude 14 and 15 of my translation, Now in fact, Enoch, who was the seventh in descent from Adam, prophesied against individuals, the people during, living during the 70th week of Daniel under Antichrist. He prophesied against individuals like these, these being the Jewish zealots in the first century AD. Namely, by asserting, look, the Lord is returning with a countless number of his holy ones. And here's the purpose why, for the reason doing this. Why is he returning from the third heaven? In order to execute judgment against each and every person. And then, as I said before, the second purpose clause gets more specific. Specifically, for the purpose of convicting each and every person because of each and every one of their ungodly actions, which they committed in an ungodly manner. And correspondingly, the second causal clause in that second purpose clause asserts because of each and every one of their harsh words, which they have spoken against the Lord. So, uh, as, as we noted in our study of Jude 15, we have two purpose clauses, that uh, two infinitival purpose clauses. Now, both the infinitive conjugation of the verb poieo, which I translate in order to execute, in the first causal clause, and the infinitive, infinitive conjugation of the verb elenco, for the purpose of convicting, I translate it, which appears in the second infinitival clause. They both indicate the purpose or the goal of the action of its controlling verb, which appears in verse 14. And that word is erkomai. We have the uh, third person singular, aris active indicative conjugation of the verb erkomai, which speaks of the Lord returning, quote unquote, to planet Earth, from the throne room of God in the third heaven at his second advent. So therefore, the first infinitival purpose clause indicates that the purpose of the Lord returning to planet Earth at his second advent is to execute judgment against each and every unrepentant, unregenerate person living on the Earth at the time of his second advent. Uh, uh, and he's going to convict them of um, uh, going to execute judgment against them because of sinning against him. So therefore, again, this first infinitival purpose clause 
indicates that the purpose of the Lord returning to earth at his second advent is to execute judgment against each and every unrepentant, unregenerate person living on the earth at the time of his second advent. The second infinitive purpose clause explains in greater detail the first. So therefore, the second is describing specifically exactly what Jude means when he asserts that the Lord will return to earth in order to execute judgment against every person who rejects him as Savior. Consequently, this uh, second one is in second purpose clause is describing this judgment as the Lord convicting each and every person of their sin because of each and every one of their ungodly actions, which they committed in an ungodly manner. Secondly, it is describing this judgment as the Lord convicting each and every one of these individuals of sin because of each and every one of their harsh words, which they have spoken against him during the course of their lives. So uh, the Lord is, this is talking at the second advent, is where the Lord uh, ex exercises his wrath. In fact, the seven seal trumpet and bowl judgments that you see poured out upon the world during the 70th week of Daniel are really called, described as the wrath of the Lamb. You know, everybody wants a nice, loving Jesus, and he is a loving God, but not the kind of love that they think. They think in, they think in sentimental terms, like not, but they don't think of what the but describe the love of God correctly. People don't understand the love of God unless they know their Bible and they're led by the Spirit. But most people, when they think of the love of God, they think of some kind of sentimental thing, like the, the love of my grandmother. You know, it's not like that at all. And so uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, because he's holy, like his Father in the Spirit, is going to ex exercise his wrath against people who reject him as Savior, because rejecting him as Savior leaves God and Jesus, who's God, no choice but to judge. See, if God didn't judge, he's not God. Okay? If God doesn't judge, he's not God. You get some other God. And that's very important. But if you also, if you don't have a God, if you don't have a God that uh, that sent his son to the cross to suffer his wrath in our place, the human in the place of the human race, so that the human race wouldn't have to suffer the wrath of God forever in the lake of fire, if you don't have that as your God, who provides a sacrifice that will uh, propitiate the holiness of God, then you don't have really the true living God. So yes, the God has, you know, God is, uh, he's transcendent, he's imminent, he's, he's above his, uh, uh, he's, uh, he's outside the time, matter, space, continuum, and he's also uh, in the time, matter, space, continuum. He fills all things, and he's outside of it. He's not, he's not, uh, he's not, um, he's not, he doesn't have to, uh, he's not uh, tied to the t like we are to the time matter space continuum also god is a god of wrath he's holiness uh, he's perfection he doesn't tolerate sin or sinners unless there's a way to that uh, that he makes uh, available to his son and he, he makes that way available to his son otherwise there's no chance whatsoever that you can uh, you get saved or enter into relationship with god apart from his son jesus christ because you have to be perfect God's perfect. Uh, I remember I was uh, listening to Tim Keller. He was teaching in New York City and uh, his church there. Uh, you can keep him in prayer. He's been ill. Um, but he was talking about, you made the point that somebody was talking about the, they were asking college kids to read the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7, the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount discourse. And the, the, all the kids, they said, this is absolutely ridiculous. This is insane. No, it says, be perfect like your heavenly father is perfect, Jesus said. They all said, that's insane. Nobody could do that. And that's exactly the point that Jesus is trying to get across to the audience there. Nobody is perfect. Perfection. God is holy. When God, when you use see the term holy used to God, okay, it's talking about the fact that God is, is set apart from his creatures, both men and angels, and his creation. He, he's transcendent. His character is transcendent. When we're talking about holiness with regards to Christians, we're talking about our sanctification, which we have in a positional sense at the moment of our justification through the baptism of the Spirit, where we're sanctified uh, in Christ. And then in a positional, a perfective sense, in a resurrection body, will be our sanctification will be perfected. And then we can experience that sanctification, experience being set apart to serve God exclusively through obedience to His Word. So, uh, with God, though, when the term holy is used, 
it's talking about his character that it's transcendent and it's transcendent of his creatures because his creatures, both men and angels, are, uh, uh, are, have, all, have all fallen short of the glory of God, of all are not perfect like he is. So he demands perfection. So he sent his son to the cross to live the life of perfection, perfect obedience to the law that we couldn't do. He fulfilled what he taught in the Sermon on the Mount. Thus he was the perfect sacrifice to intercede and take the place of sinners. So Jesus, who knew no sin, who lived the law perfectly, he suffered the wrath of God in place of members of the human race, both Jew and Gentile, so that they would not suffer the wrath of God in the lake of fire forever. That's the love of God. God loves his enemies. And so uh, we see that um, God is Jesus is holy, and even when he exercises judgment during the, the with his these seven seal trumpet and bowl judgments, mentioned in Revelation six through eighteen, as I said before, when he does that, he really showing his he's really trying to express his love in the sense of through crisis evangelism. What I mean by that, it's only through the crisis that happens as a result of these judgments during the tribulation period that people will see their need for Jesus and the Savior, and many. Uh, G Gentiles, will, millions will trust in Jesus during that period. Many will reject him, of course. And of course, 144,000 Jews will believe. And then the majority of Jews will believe in him at his second advent, the national regeneration and restoration of the Jewish people. And mentioned in many passages, like in Ro Re Romans chapter 11, 25 through 27, and Zechariah 12 and 14, those chapters. So, uh, the wrath of the Lamb. You know, Jesus is going to exercise his wrath and that's what he's going to do at his second advent. And so if you're not going to get the message and be humbled and see your need for Jesus, then he's going to have the, he's going to have through the fall of the elect angels remove you from the face of the earth if you're living during that time. And you'll be sent into torments and the, the execution of eternal condemnation will be finished off at the great white throne judgment, Revelation 20, 11 through 15. Look at, Look at uh, uh, Revelation chapter 5, please. Revelation chapter 5, verse 1. Great passage, of course. So in Revelation 5, we have Jesus breaking the seven-sealed scroll, which is basically containing the the title deed to planet Earth. Now, if for those of you who've been following me in this series on, on Jude, I've been bringing this out a lot. Uh, the, you know, with the Jewish zealots rejecting governmental authority, they're actually rejecting rejecting Satan's authority that was delegated to him by the Lord after as a result of the the fall of Adam and Eve. Remember, in Genesis chapter one, twenty six to twenty eight, God created Adam and Eve to rule over His creation. Satan comes in deceives the woman, Adam goes along and eats, eats from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and so plunges the whole human race into sin. And not only that, but it's in sin, enslavement to sin and Satan. So he's now the God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, 1 John 5, 19 says the whole world's under his power. He offered the kingdoms of the world to Jesus, and tempting him, saying, worship me, bow down and worship me, and I'll give you all these kingdoms. But, and of course, that would have been a legitimate temptation if he didn't have that authority and possession of these things. So right now, he's the God of this world. And so uh, Jesus came to, uh, to uh, basically restore mankind to the, for the, to the purpose for which he was originally created, which is to rule over his, the works of his hands. So everyone who believes in Jesus during the church age becomes the bride of Christ. Ephesians talks about that at the end of chapter 5. And, uh, and so uh, we're the, the bride of Christ. And so the church and Jesus will rule over the works of God's hands during the millennial reign of Christ and thus the restoration of humanity to its rightful place, over the, ruling over the creation. And so remember, Jesus is the God-man. So he's the last Adam. He's the bridegroom. We're the bride. Ephesians chapter 5 talks about 23 to the end of the chapter. So... Uh, right, so right now, when, when, when Jesus breaks the seven sealed uh, scroll that contains the title of the earth, he's the only one that is worthy to open this 
because he's holy, as we'll say. And, and so this gives him the right to, uh, to uh, uh, exercise his judgment against the inhabitants of planet Earth for rejecting him. And again, many will be saved because of it. They'll see their need for Jesus. They'll be humbled, but many will not. So look at Revelation, with that background out of the way, look at Revelation chapter 5, verse 1. Then I saw, John says, and the right hand of the one who was seated on the throne, and that's the Father seated on the throne, a scroll written on the front and back and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a powerful angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? Note the word worthy. But no one, in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look into it. No human being or angel for that matter is what he's saying. So I began weeping bitterly because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look into it. Then one of the elders said to me, stop, look, stop weeping. Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has conquered. Thus he can open the scroll and its seven seals. So, in other words, if there was an angel, if there was an angel like Michael or Gabriel, worthy to open this seven seal scroll, he would have went up and opened it. But there was none worthy. That's telling you that the all the angels, the angels fell, and just the way um, we can't go get there was not, there's not a lot of details, but you can see through inference, just like Adam and Eve plunged the, their progeny, the the hu human race into sin. So Satan, who was the head of the angelic race, plunged uh, the angels into sin. In fact, uh, maybe it says in Job, that he charges his, his angels with uh, sin, with, uh, with wrongdoing. And so uh, we see that Revelation 12 makes clear that two-thirds of the angels went with God after their fall. They trusted in him. The other third, led by Satan, rejected the Lord, did not have faith in him. So it says in verse 6, Continuing on, then I saw standing in the middle of the throne and of the four living creatures, which represent uh, the angels, and in the middle of the elders, which represents the church, a lamb, obviously the Lord, that appeared to have been killed. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. That's, that's a, a metaphorical reference to the Holy Spirit because seven is the number of perfection, spiritual perfection. And so these seven spirits of God were sent out into all the earth. And then he came and took the scroll from the right hand, the father of the one who was seated on the throne. And we had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders threw themselves down to the ground before the lamb. Each of them had a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. They were singing a new song. You were worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were killed. And at the cost of your own blood, you have purchased for God persons from every tribe, language, people, and nation. You have appointed them as a kingdom of priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels in a circle around the throne, as well as the living creatures and the elders. Their number was 10,000 times 10,000, thousands times thousands, all of whom were singing in a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb, Jesus, who was killed to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven, on earth, on earth, under the earth, in the sea and all that is in them singing to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb be praise, honor, glory and ruling power forever and ever. And the four living creatures were saying, Amen. And the elders threw themselves to the ground and worship. Now look at verse one, chapter 1. Chapter 6, verse 1. I looked on when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a thunderous voice, Come. So I looked, and here came a white horse, the one who rode it at a bow, and he was given a crown, and as a conqueror he rode out to conquer. Then when the Lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come. And another horse, fiery red, came out, and the one who rode it was granted permission to take peace from the earth so that people would butcher one another. And he was given a huge sword. Then when the land opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, Come. So I looked, and here came a black horse. The one who rode it had a balanced scale in his hand. Then I heard something like a voice from among the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat will cost a day's pay, 
and three quarts of barley will cost a day's pay. But do no damage, uh, do not damage the olive oil and the wine. Then, when the lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the four living creatures, the fourth, fourth living creature, saying, "Come." So I looked, and here came a pale green horse. The name of the one who rode it was Death, and Hades followed right behind. They were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill its population with the sword, famine, and disease, and by the wild animals of the earth. Now when the lamb opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been violently killed because of the word of God and because of the testimony they had given. They cried out with a loud voice, How long, sovereign master, holy and true, before you judge those who live on the earth and avenge our blood? And each of them was given a long white robe, and they were told to rest for a little longer until the full number was reached of both their fellow servants and their brothers who were going to be killed during the tribulation period, of course, just as they had been. Then verse 12 says, Then I looked, when the Lamb opened the sixth seal, a huge earthquake took place. The sun became as black as sackcloth made of hair, and the full moon became blood red, and the stars in the sky fell to the earth like a fig tree dropping its unripe figs when shaken by a fierce wind. The sky was split apart, like a scroll rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the very important people, the generals, the rich, the powerful, and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of the one who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, because the the great day of their wrath has come and who is able to withstand it? Rhetorical question to being a negative, emphatic response. Nobody. Go back now to Jude, verse 14 and 15 now. So we see that if you want to avoid the wrath of the Lamb during the 70th week of Daniel, which actually, if... The rapture is in our generation. If the rapture happens to, happens today, that means that the sec, se, uh, the seventieth week of Daniel will soon begin. It's imminent. Because if the rapture is imminent, the second the seventieth week of Daniel is imminent, and we know that because if you read Second Thessalonians chapter two, excuse me, uh, verses one through twelve, it says that again, as I mentioned earlier, and we studied this in detail. The Spirit, once the Spirit is removed, the Spirit indwells each member of the church. Eight, Romans 8, 11 talks about that. Uh, you, you, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Uh, for 1 Thessalonians 3, 16. So each member of the church is indwelt by the Spirit once he's been removed. He's the restrainer in 2 Thessalonians 2, 6 and 7. Once he's removed, then Antichrist can appear and make that treaty with Israel, which starts the 70th week. And there seems to be not very short, there's no no interval of time, it seems like. It seems like boom. So um, it could be an interval of time, I don't know. But it seems to me that it's imminent. So if the if the rapture is imminent, that means the 70th week of Daniel is imminent. So uh, could the Antichrist be on the earth right now? Yeah, if it's the rapture generation, yeah. But right now, um, we don't know because we won't know until we're raptured. How's that? It really, it's the facts. That's how you won't know until, we won't know until we're gone, okay, who he will be. He will be. And that's true of everybody on the, in the human race living at that time. So, uh, so if you want to avoid the wrath of the Lamb, you need, to, you need to accept by faith the love of the Lamb. If you want to avoid the wrath of the Lamb, and that, not just the wrath of the Lamb during the 70th week, but the wrath of the Lamb in the lake of fire forever, then you need to accept by faith His act of love his awesome, un- incomparable act of love at Calvary 2,000 years ago. If you don't accept him by faith in his death and resurrection, then you will have to suffer the wrath of the Lamb in the lake of fire forever. And if you're living during the time, the events of the 70th week of Daniel, you're going to have to experience that wrath then as well. So, and of course, God desires all people to be saved. You know, God sent his Son of the Cross for all people First, First Timothy four ten talks about that. First John two two, he desired it's unlimited atonement. God wants all people to be saved. The heretical doctrine, the limited atonement, where Christ only died for the elect, 
That's heresy. That's an insult, an attack on God's character and integrity. And it quite blatantly rejects scripture. And by the way, Calvin didn't adhere to Calvinism. You know, five-point Calvinism. Uh, Bezer is the one, his, his disciple, he's the knucklehead that, that promoted that stuff, limited atonement. But if you, because I, I know I've seen the com uh, commentaries uh, my pastor gave me years ago of, uh, uh, hi highlighting in, in, in Calvin's commentaries that he was unlimited atonement. But, uh, you know, people who want to adhere to their theological systems, they don't want to change, even though the Word of God, the Holy Spirit, and the Scriptures is telling them quite clearly they will totally do uh, uh, exegetical handstands around those passages and and try to explain them them away, which make not uh, rejecting what the plain sense of the passage has to say and those that I mentioned you, those passages I gave you for support. There's many others, by the way. So I'll look at Jude 14 and 15 again in my translation. Now, in fact, Enoch, who was the seventh descent from Adam, prophesied against individuals like these, namely by asserting, look, the Lord is returning with a countless number of his holy ones in order to execute judgment against each and every person. So the word judgment there is the noun in, in the Greek noun krisis, which appears in the first purpose clause and it pertains to the act of judging a person which results in a legal or moral determination. In context, this word speaks of the judgment of every unregenerate, unrepentant human being living on the earth at the time of our Lord's second advent. This will result in the elect angels removing these individuals from the earth where they'll be placed temporarily in torments for documentation Look at Luke 16, 19 through 31. Eventually, according to Revelation 20, 11 through 15, they will appear at the great white throne judgment of every unrepentant human being on the face of the earth in, in past, present, and future. They will appear at the great uh, white throne judgment at the end of human history where they will receive the execution of their sentence to experience eternal condemnation in the lake of fire. They receive this judgment because of their rejection of Jesus Christ as their Savior, since sinners cannot, under any circumstances, enter into a relationship or a fellowship with the Holy God without a mediator, who is Jesus Christ. That's why I said many times, you can't get saved if you, there's certain things that about, when it says believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved, okay? There's certain things about Jesus that you have to believe in order to get saved, okay? So believe in the Lord Jesus Christ is kind of an umbrella term. What, what, what about Jesus do I need to believe? You need First of all, you need to believe that he rose from the dead. If you reject the resurrection, you're not going to get saved. Why? Because if he's just died on the cross, he's just another dead person who was executed by the Romans because he thought he was something that he was not. Okay? He's like anybody else. Okay? Any other criminal. So if he rises from the dead, that changes it all. Okay? That means God has vindicated him and has accepted his work on the cross as the payment for our sins. The other thing is, you need to believe he's both God and man. Because if he's not both God and man, there's no mediator between a sinful human beings and a holy God. That's why the son had to become a human being. Because to be a mediator between his father and us. So, these unregenerate individuals who reject Jesus Christ, at, at, who are living at the time of his second advent, they receive the ju this judgment because of their rejection of him as their savior because sinners cannot under any circumstances enter into a relationship with a, or fellowship with the Holy God without a mediator, and that is Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 2.5 for documentation. They need a mediator and a savior like we all do because all of us in the human race, past, present, and future, are sinners by nature and practice. That's the whole thing that Paul says in First Romans 1-3, through three, those chapters. The sinner, though, who trusts in Jesus as their Savior, is declared justified by the Father and simultaneously receives the forgiveness of sins, eternal life, and has been entered into an eternal relationship with the Trinity. That's the story of Romans 3, uh, 19, to the end of that chapter in, the, in, in, in Romans chapter 4, and Romans chapter 5, 1 through 11. Furthermore, at the moment of justification, which is the subject of Romans 3, 4, and 5, at the moment of justification, they are identified with Jesus Christ in his crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and session at the right hand of the Father through the baptism of the Spirit. 
Now, if you look at that purpose clause in, in Jude, look at that, uh, my translation again, verses 14 and 15. Now, in fact, Enoch, who was the seventh in descent from Adam, prophesied against individuals like these, namely by asserting, look, the Lord is returning with a countless number of his holy ones. And then he says, in order to execute judgment against each and every person. So the expression uh, in, in my translation, in order to execute, is translating the infinitive conjugation of the verb poieo, which pertains to carrying out or performing an action which is in compliance with a legal sentence. And in context, it refers to the Lord executing the sentence of eternal condemnation against every human being, unsaved, unregenerate human being, living on the earth at the time of his second advent. And when it says every person, uh, that's the, the genitive masculine plural form of the adjective pas, and that's referring to every unrepentant, unregenerate person of the human, members of the human race, who will live, every, it's speaking of every unrepentant, unregenerate member of the human race who are living on the earth at the time of the second advent. It's used in a distributive sense, this word. It actually means all, but it can be used in a distributive sense, emphasizing no exceptions. And that's the way it's used here. Now, this word is the object of the preposition kata, kata, which is functioning here as a marker of opposition. Therefore, this prepositional phrase is expressing the idea that the Lord will return to planet earth at his second advent in order to execute judgment against, quote unquote, each and every unregenerate, unrepent, unrepentant person living on the earth at the time of his second advent. Now, the word for person, pesuke, which it pertains to a human being as a living soul or being, or in other words, it pertains to an entity with personhood. Specifically here, it refers to an unrepentant, unregenerate person living on the earth at the time of our Lord's second advent. So this word is modified by the accusative feminine singular form of the adjective pas, which is used again in a distributive sense and should be translated each and every because it pertains to anyone of a totality and it's emphasizing no exception. So therefore, again, it's expressing the idea that each and every unrepentant, unregenerate person will be judged by the Lord Jesus Christ at his second advent without exception. Nobody escapes. In other words, in fact, when it comes to the uh, the uh, lake of fire, every unregenerate person who dies in that state physically is not going to escape the wrath of God. You are not going to escape. There's no way out. So the only way out is through faith in Jesus Christ. I was giving a family members uh, the gospel last night over the phone. We're talking to them, and um, and so uh, you know I because I, this is extremely important. And, uh, you know, I'm supposed to do, the, I'm a pastor who's supposed to educate and disciple people in the body of Christ. My gift is designed to benefit the body of Christ for their spiritual growth, Ephesians chapter 4, uh, 12 to 16. But also I'm supposed, as Paul told Timothy in, in his second Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. Wait a minute, first Timothy. Do the work of an evangelist. Now, there's a lot of people, as I said before, that I don't even know who's hitting our website. It's not like I got a building here where I know everybody in the room, if they're believers or not, and I can tell if it's not, you know. So here, I, you got people on face, uh, YouTube, Facebook, uh, our Faith Life Sermons website, the podcast. I don't know who's listening. So if you're, if you're not a Christian, you know, God loves you, you know, and you're a sinner, and you're in danger of the wrath of God, and I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just trying to give you the facts. If those facts scare you, that's good. That sh should scare you. I'd be terrified to face God if I was a, if I was an unbeliever now and to die and face Him. You don't want that. I mean, we have to face the Lord one way or the other. You would rather face Him as a, 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 a being someone who's been saved by Him from His wrath. And again, it doesn't cost you anything. It doesn't... You don't have to raise your hand, walk an aisle, give money to the church. You don't have to do so many Hail hey, Marys and How of Fathers. That's what they used to teach us in the Catholic Church. God's not keeping a record of you. You know, He's not going to say, okay, you did so many good deeds, so you get in heaven. And He's not, you know, you were such a nice person. Nobody, let me tell you something. Compared to God, none of us are nice. You know, one of the things the Lord has really, you know, especially over the last three years, pointed out to me, made clear, you know, I'm a wicked sinner. I mean, I knew that before. I know it now more than ever. 
And I say that because, you know, the scripture, the spirit convicts you and the spirit makes you put yourself in perspective that God is holy. We don't have a chance without a mediator. We don't have no, any chance of getting into heaven and we're going to be judged unless we go to Jesus. So it, it doesn't, we couldn't do enough good works, in other words, to gain his approval. The only one who gained his approval in the human race was his son. Remember he said, well, this is my beloved son whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. And Jesus said to believe in him. There's no other name under heaven by which men should be saved from God's wrath. So it's, it's, it's simple to get saved. It's simple. Remember, and Jesus was talking to Nicodemus and he talked about, you got to be born again. You got to believe in me and be born again. But he also used an analogy. Remember the, in Israel, in Numbers, uh, they were ticking the Lord off and he was, he was judging them. He was disciplining them. Many people were getting killed. And, he, and the Lord told Moses, okay, get this staff, you know, the serpent, and lift it up. And anybody who lifts at that, that staff, they will be safe from the plague. And he equated believing in him to avoid the wrath of God with that. Now, how much effort did those Israelites take those Israelites to be to look at that that uh, staff? Didn't, didn't, didn't take any effort. So, look to the cross. Look to the cross of Jesus. Look to his resurrection. The resurrection demonstrated that he was who he claimed to be and that he's been vindicated by God and that uh, his work on the cross was payment for our sins. So, you can live with God forever, for all of eternity. That's much better than being consigned to the lake of fire forever and experiencing the wrath of God. You know, you know, Jesus, Jesus again, he was abandoned by his father. You know, when he was facing the wrath of God, experiencing it, he was abandoned by his father. He did that so you and I wouldn't be abandoned for all of eternity in the lake of fire. That's absolutely, nobody loves you like Jesus. Nobody loved me like Jesus. Let's close. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that this lesson will be a great blessing to the, your, the body of Christ and also those who are not yet members of the body of Christ. We pray, Father, that this will be a blessing to your people again and you guide them in the application. And for those who are not Christians, I pray, Father, that the Holy Spirit would use this message today and the closing of this uh, service to convict them of sin so that they might see their need for Jesus and come to, the, to, come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name, we